Okay, uh, so now we'll talk about the third architect. Uh, uh, today, uh, Sir Richard Rogers, uh, who was born in 1933 and died in 2021, so two years ago. Let's read a little bit about him. Richard, Richard George Rogers, Baron Rogers of Riverside, uh, born on the uh, on the day of the 23rd of July, and today is the 23rd of July. Uh, so he was born uh, 90 years ago, exactly on this day. Was an Italian born, interesting, an Italian born British architect, noted for his modernist and functionalist designs in high tech architecture. Rogers was perhaps best known for his work on the Pompidou Center in Paris where he collaborated with Renzo Piano and uh, two other people, among them a brilliant uh, uh, structural engineer. Uh, the Lloyds Building and Millennium Dome, bon uh, Dome, both in London, the Senate uh, Building in Cardiff and the European Court of Human Rights Building in Strasbourg. But he built other buildings and we are going to see them. He was a winner of the Reba Gold Medal, the Thomas Jefferson Medal, the Reba Sterling Prize, the Minerva Medal, and Pritzker Prize. He was a senior partner at Roger Stirk Harbor and Partners, previously known as the Richard Rogers Partnership until the 30th of June, 2020. Uh, Richard Rogers was born in Florence, in Italy in 1933 into an Anglo-Italian family. His father, William Nino Rogers, was the cousin of Italian architect Ernesto Nathan Rogers. His ancestors moved from Sunderland to Venice in about 1800s, later settling in Trieste, Milan, and Florence. In 1939, William Nino Rogers decided to come back to England. Upon moving to England, Richard Rogers went to St. John's School in Leatherhead, Rogers did not excel academically, which made him believe that he was stupid because he, knew he could not read or memorize his schoolwork. Beautiful. And as a consequence, he stated that he became very depressed. Beautiful again. I mean, I'm sorry he suffered, but he made up for that suffering later on in his life. He wasn't able to read until the age of 11, and it was not until after he had his first child that he realized that he was di dyslex dyslexic. Um, what can you say? I, I remember now what Albert Einstein said that, you know, all people are geniuses. But if you tell a fish that he's stupid, uh, tell a fish that, uh, you know, to climb a tree, the fish would live all his life, uh, well, short life, because in a tree, a fish will not last for long, that, that he's stupid because, because he's not meant to, to climb the tree. Well, in the same way, not all children are, you know, uh, similar. So, you know, if Sir Richard Rogers, Baron and so on, later on in life, became very depressed because, uh, you know, he was meant to, he was, uh, you know, um, um, made to think that, uh, you know, I mean, he couldn't uh, read and memorize whatever his school work was, you know, it was like the fish in the little uh, saying by uh, Albert Einstein. Very sad, uh, all these schools that uh, try to, you know, uh, make everybody uh, the same. Uh, people are different. And uh, unfortunately, schools uh, try to make them uh, Anyway, after leaving St. John's School, he undertook a foundation course at Epsom School of Art, now University for the Creative Arts, before going into national service between 1951 and 1953. He then attended the Architectural Association School of Architecture in London, this incredible school which kept producing, and I hope will continue to produce, you know, those, uh, those brilliant minds that uh, make us uh, hope that uh, life is truly worth living and especially when uh, creative. Uh, I have the highest appreciation for a school which refuses to conform. So 
uh, he went to attend the Architectural Association where he gained the Architectural Association's diploma from 1954 until 1959, uh, subsequently graduating with a master's degree from the Yale School of Architecture in 1962 on a Fulbright, Fulbright, Fulbright scholarship or Fulbright scholarship. While studying at Yale, Rogers met fellow architecture student Norman Foster and planning student Sue Bramwell. Uh, after leaving Yale, he joined Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill in New York City, in New York. On returning to England in 1963, he, Norman Foster, and Bramwell set up architectural practice as, as Team Four with Wendy Chisman. Bramwell later married Rogers. Chisman married Foster, but they were Team Four, you know. Uh, Rogers and Foster earned a reputation for what was later termed by the media high-tech architecture. Now, <laughs> he seems, he continued to, say, to appear that he was depressed. You know, this man of, of, of the highest accomplishments in architecture, he does look depressed in this picture. And I like this very much because it shows to me that he was real. You know, he was not mimicking uh, being uh, what he was not. I think we need, we need truth. Even here, he doesn't look too happy, does he? And here they are. Now here he smiles <laughs> at Yale. I guess he liked it there. You know, he's dressed a little bit like a Russian with that uh, thing on the head. And then, uh, you know, the eternally uh, pleasing uh, Sir Norman Foster with his beloved camera. <laughs> Interesting picture. On the left, Sir Norman Foster. On the right, Sir Richard Rogers. Sketches, drawings by Sir uh, Richard Rogers. This is the, his last work, The Swan Song, and it's, a, it's an excellent work. And I hope I have the uh, images to convince you of that. You know, fighting against gravity uh, in a very convincing way. And even more convincing, considering this is like the last work. They're all sketches of that work, which you are going to see at the end. Anyway, other drawings by Sir Richard Rogers, Sir Richard Rogers, Sir Richard Rogers, Sir Richard Rogers, Sir Richard Rogers. Renzo Piano and Richard Rogers, 1976. Here they are, the winners of the Centre Georges Pompidou. Incredible. These two architects, you know, they, they participated in this, in this competition knowing for sure that they were not going to win. That's what I read. So because they were absolutely sure it was a very famous competition and they were absolutely sure they were not going to win, they, they did something without any fear. The Centre Georges Pompidou that we know was built and they won. So it shows again, it pays to be fearless and to take risks and to believe in what you do. They did and they won. Now, there are countless examples where people with the same optimism and with the same non-conformism, uh, you know, they, 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 they were, uh, you know, fearless and, and they didn't win. So I guess, you know, fate uh, uh, decides certain things uh, its own way. They won, other people didn't win, but I still think it's best to, 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 be, to be true to yourself and to propose what you believe in. And if it's meant to win, you win. If it's not meant to win, you don't win. Like I've heard Jean Nouvel in one of his conferences that he said, you know, I'm probably the architect who lost, lost the largest amount of competitions ever because he lost a lot of competitions. And yet, Sir Jean Nouvel, of course I'm joking, uh, became quite famous and built a lot. Here they are with a brilliant engineer behind, uh, Peter Rice, uh, a British uh, engineer, a structural engineer who unfortunately uh, died young. And then uh, in front of him, uh, Renzo Piano, and then even closer to us, 
the future Sunny Rogers. Sitting on a structural piece of the Centre Georges Pompidou. Bravo to them. Three young, brilliant people fighting for what they believe in, and they won. And they even had an umbrella, an open umbrella. And we remember what Walter Gropio said, that the mind is at its best when it is like an umbrella, open. So they had the umbrella open, they had their minds open, and they won. Team four. Now we show uh, you know some some examples of the work uh, from the very beginning. Team four. Uh, I think they built something initially for the mother of one of the team four, the parents of uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of um, I forgot if it was his wife or uh, Sir Norman's Foster's wife. It might have been Sue Bramwell. The the wife, the future wife of Richard Rogers. Uh, here there are more, more people in, in the so-called team four. There are, I think, six or seven people. Let's see them. Here they are. What is funny in a way is that actually the, the wife, the future wife of Sir Norman Foster is sitting on the lap of uh, Richard Rogers and the future wife of uh, Sir Richard Rogers sits on the lap of Norman Foster. Anyway, they were both friends and uh, the other four people were, I guess, their associates in the, in the works of uh, Team Four. And, you know, this picture also shows to me the, you know, the, the, the enthusiasm, the, well, although the, the person on the lower uh, right corner doesn't look too happy, but uh, I don't know, all in all, young people, you know, starting a career, start, starting an office. And uh, I don't know, I think it's an encouragement, no, to, to, to live, to experiment, to make mistakes. Craig Vin Cornwell in UK, 1966, this was the first building they built. And I think for the parents of uh, either the, the wife or the future wife of uh, Norman Foster or Sir Richard Rogers, I think uh, they were the parents of, uh, of uh, Sue Bramwell. And that was the, their, first, uh, their first work. Maybe these buildings are not so impressive, what is impressive is a little underground pavilion, which I hope I have here. Um, well, in time, concrete uh, becomes, uh, you know, a little bit uh, affected by the elements. But this is the pavilion that I'm talking about with the binoculars there to inspect, uh, you know, uh, the horizon. I, yeah, here you see it again. It's, it's half underground. And I, I, I like it. It's, you know, a little exercise in building. The retreat, Creek Finn Bin House, Team 4, a view from the inside. They even have a little kitchenette there, as you can see. Young architects, idealistic, playful, submerged, submerged under the level of, of, of the ground. Anyway, some more recent drawings of this, maybe not so relevant, a sketch of the, of the little pavilion, and here is the section through it. Team four. Now Reliance Controls Factory, 1967. The ide idealistic 1968 were not far away. And here we see, you know, the the, the aesthetics of uh, high tech. Very very well exemplified. It's a simple structure, but it still has nobility. And it is, it is architecture, it's not just construction, it's architecture. I 
I don't know in what way Yale University influenced them, but they returned to England with a great appetite for doing architecture. And this high-tech architecture, I think, was very successful. Now, Richard and Sue Rogers, architects, with John Young and Lolly Abbott, they built this um, uh, 22 park site. I hope I have pictures. No, I don't. But I have the Zip Up House. Uh, or is it the same project? Anyway, they split. Uh, Richard Rogers uh, didn't work any longer with uh, Norman Foster, and he created a partnership with his wife, Sue Rogers. And this is the Zip Up House from 1967, 1969, an experimental house. Uh, was designed between yeah, 1967 and 1969 for the House of Today competition, which was sponsored by DuPont and was exhibited in 1969, the Ideal Home Exhibition in London. The design was for a factory built house, quick to assemble and reassemble with cheap insulation panels that are used on refrigeration trucks with rapid construction, all at low cost. Richard Rogers wrote, buying clothes off the rack is the norm. We wanted to do the same for the house, an aff affordable, speedy kit of parts. And here it is in a model. It was in the air, you know, the magnificent 60s, you know, late 60s, the hippie movement, the fight against war, against Vietnam, the fight against money and banks, the fight for love, not war. And in architecture, it was this idealism uh, also present. And I think this kind of involvement with society, with, uh, with uh, you know, uh, a motivation to, uh, to be militant, to fight for a cause which was not just aesthetical and was not primarily aesthetical, it was very important, and uh, uh, today I think something like this is missing. Then there was the music, no, of the late 60s. My God, my God, who could forget? So there was something then that I think would be good to, to rejuvenate, if possible. And these were not arrogant architects who were just uh, building for the rich. They also thought of the social implications of building. And they also thought of those underprivileged people. And actually, Sir Richard Rogers, even after he became a baron, a sir, built some social housing, which I'm going to see later. Piano and Rogers, now they won the competition. But before they won the competition, they won it for Saint, Saint George Pompidou, 1971, 19, 1977. They built already the universal oil products in UK and the BMB Italia, head, Italia headquarters in Como in Italy, 1972-1973. And after Pompidou, they built IRCAM in Paris and uh, Pet Center, uh, Pet Center Research Laboratory in Melbourne, maybe Melbourne with an E at the end. No, no, this is a different Melbourne in UK. Anyway, here they are. I love this picture. I love this picture. I mean, you know, if you are an architect, prove it. If you are creative, prove it. And you might win. And they won. And they have the, they have the smile. Even, even the depressed one, Sir Richard Rogers, is smiling, if not laughing. And so does Renzo Piano. BMB Italia, 1972-1973. A uh, high-tech building, uh, you know, with simple means, create architecture. Color, yes, color. Why should everything be white? No. Life is colorful. Nature is colorful. Let's also create, at least sometimes, colorful buildings, like uh, John Johansson, for example at least in some part of his architecture. And here again, we see the, we see the vivacity of uh, pipes uh, brought into the aesthetical realm, mainly because of color, or in good measure, because of color. 
the Pompidou Center. My God, my God, who would have thought in Paris, Hosman's uh, Paris, such a building, 1971-1978. Here it is. And Peter Rice contributed to it. Let us not forget. And there was, unfortunately, a third architect. And, and I, 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 am, I, am, uh, I am ashamed, actually, that I didn't memorize his name. He, unfortunately, followed a different path. And he almost exited history. Uh, and we only remember now uh, Richard Rogers and uh, Renzo Piano. But Peter Rice also very important. And we saw a picture of three of them on that uh, structural uh, element uh, of, the, of the main facade of the building. It's a machinery, no? It's, it's, a, uh, it's a machinery for uh, cultural events, for uh, art, for exhibiting art. So again, it's important to remember these people, these young, architects plus a young engineer, since they were absolutely sure that they were not going to win the competition, they did whatever crossed their mind and they won. What a better encouragement to be creative and to be fearless. Those pipes that Louis Kahn abhorred because you know he was afraid that they might, uh, you know, uh, disorient and destroy, you know, uh, destroy architecture. These people brought the pipes out of the building, colored them um, honestly and uh, you know eloquently, and uh, in this way they they uh, uh, were able to free the space inside from their presence. So those very, uh, you know, utilitarian elements, the pipes, became sculptural modes of expression towards the street, towards the square, towards Paris. And so, and so you know, it was an alchemical transformation. They transformed what was prosaic and utilitarian into the very opposite. And they succeeded. I don't know who did this. Uh, was it uh, Sir Richard Rogers or Renzo Piano? Anyway, an adventure. And they won. Centre Georges Pompidou. Technology meets art. Color meets the pipe. The engineer meets the architect. And that together they create a building that uh, says yes to life and unafraid to, uh, you know, uh, provoke. The paradox is that when I was much younger, I wrote against this building, which I didn't understand. I, I was very young, it's true. But, uh, you know, since then I changed my mind. Now, the Richard Rogers partnership, the Lloyds in London, one of his most important buildings, 1978-1984, uh, sorry about that, zero, is 1984. Richard Rogers' first high-tech building, well, working alone with his own firm, a uh, famous building in London, and uh, again, uh, sculptural machinery. Is it cold? I wouldn't say so. Yes, it uses steel, but uh, the manipulation of the of the volumes uh, in steel is uh, is animated by uh, by worms, and uh, I think he was able again for of some kind of transformation. This is not a cold building. It's a building that is. Um, uh, emphatically uh, 
I think uh, proclaiming that uh, sculpturalness is important for architecture, both inside and outside, and uh, I think it succeeds. Richard Rogers did a neat historicism. You know, he, he, he had the, the vitality of, a, of an inspired architect who didn't need, uh, you know, the cane of, of, of uh, historicism. I mean, he went through that period we call uh, postmodernism, but he was not affected by it. Here we see, you know, kind of, I mean, conceptually speaking, what he did here is not very dissimilar from what uh, uh, Louis Kahn did, uh, you know, in uh, Richard's laboratories in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Philadelphia, where he brought the stairs and the service um, uh, elements of the building outside of the building. So then you have the, the purity of the main function of the building undisturbed by the serving spaces. Outside, they brought, I mean, Richard Rogers and his, his uh, collaborators brought the viscerality of the building outside. Instead of hiding these things inside, they brought them outside. I always suspected that Sir Richard Rogers or Richard Rogers was a, an honest man. And his architecture shows this. You know, it's, it's, it's an architecture that does not hide. Lloyd's in London. I'm not usually inclined towards uh, applauding high tech buildings, but the fact that here, you know, he uses, um, let's say, uh, techno uh, architecture uh, in some kind of a marriage with a, with a, with a viscerality of, uh, of life itself, in my opinion, creates a, an honest building. It is an honest building. And it's not uh, just uh, an exercise in, uh, you know, uh, sleek uh, aesthetics. Character is very important in architecture, and the character of the of the author of the architect manifests itself through the building that he or she builds. The Reuters Data Center in London, 1987-1992. Yes, Richard Rogers went through the postmodern. Uh, um, you know, a period without being affected by it. And he was one of the very few. If you look at what Ken Gokuma, for example, did uh, during the, well, actually a little bit later in the late uh, 80s or early 90s, you'd realize uh, that, uh, you know, uh, it was not easy to escape the, the, the influence of postmodernism and the, you know, the infatuation with historicism. But, Richard Rogers was not affected by it. The European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, 1994. He remained true to himself, to the materials he always used in his architecture. It's not a nostalgic architecture. It's an architecture that uh, believes in the present, believes in technology, but he's able to animate them with, um, with a spirit that is uh, not techni technicist, I would say, as paradoxically my statement might appear. A lot of steel, yes. He believed in, in metals, in steel. He built some uh, beautiful uh, palaces of justice. I hope I, I have them here. Uh, two of them at least are brilliant. 
uh, now a, a building in Tokyo, a tower, very much uh, Sir Richard Rogers in terms of its architecture. Now the Daimler Chrysler building, buildings in Berlin were also his former partner Renzo Piano built. Now, you know, I just noticed, you see this um, detail, so to speak, which is, which was built by Renzo Piano. And now we look here, very similar, but this is by R Richard Rogers. And this is by uh, Renzo Piano. The building by Richard Rogers is this one. This building in the background is by uh, Renzo Piano. So the former two partners uh, met in Berlin again. Sir Richard Rogers, not bad. We have to say it. it's not bad. Potsdamer Platz. Now, of course, building for a very, you know, uh, rich client. Chrysler, Mercedes, Daimler. Sir Richard Rogers. And here is uh, Renzo Piano. Color again. I think it's important to underline the presence of color in the in the works of uh, uh, Sir Richard Rogers. Because he's able to warm up otherwise, uh, you know, uh, an architecture which, which intrinsically would be rather cold. The Channel 4 headquarters in London, 1990-1994. The sculpture, the sculptural installation is not his, but the building is. And again, the presence of color matters. I could almost approximate his architecture as being a techno visceralization. Technochromatic visceralization. The Welsh Parliament, a great building, 1999-2005. Look at this. You know, it's, it's a governmental building, but it's a building that uh, encourages one to, to even dream and also to even dream a collective dream. Why should governmental buildings be boring or authoritarian when they could actually express, uh, you know, a desire to, for the common good, a desire for togetherness, a confidence in, uh, in the, in, you know, in the, in the, in the rightness or um, uh, you know the 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 correctness of the decisions taken there and the architecture is um, look in the section this is not a banal building with um, offices or rooms aligned on a corridor it's you see it's almost like a, a winged togetherness that's what i see the two wings uh, but Togetherness, because that central part, which is cultural and primal, uh, is uh, kind of an ur architecture, is very powerful and it expresses the togetherness that such a, an important building, a, you know, a parliament, a governmental building should express. Art is present, expression is present, emotion is present. He was 
as a human is. And look at the look at the roofing, look at the ceiling. And look at the people, they come together because that powerful central, the core of the building is bringing people together. It's like a giant mushroom that says, be together. And the people do come together. So the, the you know, architecture is important. Okay, it cannot uh, change everything. It cannot... Uh, maybe uh, achieve that paradisiacal condition that we maybe aspire towards, but it could make small improvements and uh, maybe not so small sometimes. It does matter architecture. And look, the presence of, uh, of the artistic uh, side of, of, of the creators of the building. You know, it, it's, it's a building that doesn't leave you indifferent and this matters. Who could say that this is not impressive? Bravo to Sir Richard Rogers. And this canopy, which advances towards the city, is welcoming the people, is inviting them in, in a way, it tells them, be together with your government, collaborate with the government, be the government, we the people. As a reality, not as an unattainable ideal. He was an excellent architect. Not too many so-called high-tech architects who do what we look at here, no. Because he was not afraid of the organic. Now we look at another interesting work, the law courts or the Palace of Justice in Belgium, in Antwerp, 2000-2006. Uh, Although he built an even better one in France, and we are going to, I hope, going to see that one as well. But this one also shows, you know, the aspiration towards justice that the Palace of Justice should have. Is it sculptural? Yes. Does it have expression? Yes. It's a horizontal building maybe maybe it could have been a little bit uh, because it's 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 hard they i mean it depends you aspire towards um, horizontality or you aspire towards verticality or you aspire towards both but even here we see the value of the roofing and the ceiling that uh, you know connects you know the terrestrial with the celestial if i am to express myself uh, maybe in exalted terms. But when it comes to justice, you know, it's important to, to know that uh, beyond our human affairs exists something, you know, like almost like a divine right. And we shouldn't forget, uh, we shouldn't forget it. Often in his architecture, he's not the only one like this, the ceiling and the roofing, express the transition between the human affairs here on the earth and the sky. And, 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 and then architecture becomes, uh, um, you know, exuberant towards the top, the coiffure of the building. And this is how the building looks like from the top. To an extent, to an extent, it is exalted. And this one, this, this one, I like even more. Le Palais de Justice in Bordeaux, in France, 1993, 1999. 
another palace of justice. Um, a very creative architect and who was not afraid of, um, of uh, having a dialogue, so to speak, with myth. There is something, I think, in some of his works that shows um, uh, deep intuitions or deep instincts, like these, uh, you know, conical rooms, which are primal, you know, uh, they, they pierce they pierce the roof in the same alone vital towards the sky, meaning towards, in a way, divine justice. So there is a dialogue. That's why they are almost chapels. These rooms where terrestrial justice is uh, uh, hopefully offered or discussed, uh, uh, these chapels of justice uh, seem to suggest that they are not indifferent to what is above them. I don't know if I explained well what I tried to explain, but it's a, it's a very interesting architecture, which, which is uh, not just a banal uh, functionalism. It transcends function. It includes the metaphysical. And the metaphysical is important for architecture, and in its absence, architecture is not culture. And if it's not culture, it's not architecture. Alvaralto put it very simply, architecture belongs to culture, not to civilization. He expressed himself very abruptly, almost surprisingly, considering he was a reticent man, uh, Alvaralto. Architecture belongs to culture, not to civilization. The second part is the most interesting, not to civilization. And the chapels of justice, if I am allowed to call them so. Uh, the, you know, when you look at this image and you don't know what it is, you could almost say it's a chapel. Yes, it's a chapel with the light coming from above and the shape of the container. Very interesting work. And also interesting is the entrance where in order to arrive in the building, you go above a piece of water. So it's like you are purifying yourself. You are purging yourself on your way towards the building of justice. This reminds me of a, a sketch I did for a possible house for the brothers Karamazov, you know, the famous uh, brothers made famous by uh, Fyodor Dostoevsky, where I gave the entrance into the hut of Alyosha, the saint of all four brothers, after you crossed a piece of water. I did it unconscious, I mean, you know, um, I don't know if I should say unconsciously, instinctually. Uh, but here I see also something in this sense that you have to purge yourself, to purify yourself in order to wake, walk up the stairs that enter the palace of justice, where you are supposed to either serve justice or be served by justice. The Madrid Barajas uh, Airport Terminal 4, another good work by Sir Richard Rogers. There is drama, yes. Yes, but what would architecture be without some drama in terms of space, in terms of construction uh, um, entities, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, the meeting between structure and ornament. The ornament is not obvious in his work per se, but 
the structures that he uses are dramatic enough to assume an ornamental um, uh, you know disposition so to speak like the roof itself you know it's 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 ornamental in a way you know it, it welcomes the capriciousness of form and the fluidity of form is not just born from calculation and uh, you know prosaic interests no so there is exaltation in this building. The Millennium Dome, London, UK, 1996-1999. Now, this was the former pupil afraid that he was stupid and depressed. Can you believe it? I do believe it. And it's, it's beautiful that, you know, he showed through his own life and his own works that you can transcend, you know, inferiority, feeling inferior. You can transcend, uh, you know, uh, feeling inadequate through dedicating yourself creatively to uh, clearly formulate it, or maybe sometimes not so clearly formulate it, yes to life. Look at these structural elements. It's culture, it's evocative, it's emotion, and it functions as intended, as structure. And it's monumental, it's big. Look at the human silhouettes. Oh, the, the sculptural work is not his. Now, his firm became Roger Sturk Harbour and Partners, the British Museum, World Conservation and Exhibition Center in London, 2007-2014, is this work here on the right. An exercise in reticence and subtlety. So he was capable of, uh, of uh, negotiating with, a, you know, a certain context in, uh, in terms of uh, fineness, l'esprit de finesse. That's what we see here. And look at the beauty of this detail. This man fought depression through beauty. That's what he did. One Hyde Park, London, 2007-2010. These are luxurious apartment buildings, those four that you see there. Uh, and uh, But the same man who built these also built social housing, and we are going to see it or see them. So these buildings, yes, are for the, you know, the affluent ones. You can see from the from the neighboring uh, buildings that these are, you know, placed uh, in a special context. Not to speak about the parade in front of them, and you will see the plans of the of the four buildings. Unafraid to assert the new 
in the vicinity of um, older buildings with a different aesthetic, you know, with, uh, the, you know, maybe Victorian buildings, but he didn't need to mimic those Victorian buildings. And here are the plants. I hope uh, here you can see better. You know, it's it's, it's a huge building. You know, uh, I mean, uh, huge with uh, yeah. Uh, you know, it's 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 a building again, which uh, not too many could afford to live in. But uh, that's how life is. Some people can. Some people can't. One Hyde Park, London. So we do have here multiplicity in unity. There is the spine that connects all the buildings and then you have the individuality, individuality of one building and then we have the individuality of the, each unit within the building. the Y cube in London. And these are, you know, inexpensive housing units for temporary stays for those who, who are not privileged. And I like very much the fact that the men who designed these also found resources to design the Y cube in London. Modest, uh, you know, uh, houses, where he tried to bring joy to the, the temporary inhabitants through color, through, you know, offering decent uh, uh, lodgings to, to those who are much less privileged than the previous uh, ones in those luxurious buildings in, in Hyde Park. But there is architecture here as well. A good architect can work with low budgets a good architect can serve both rich and poor. And look at the units, the housing units. They are very modest, but they are decent. And they are made, they were made by um, a famous architect. And I'm not talking here about glamour, you know, the glamour of a famous architect, but an architect who deserves his name to be an architect. And who worked, you see, it's very, it's a very modest uh, housing unit. You know, you enter directly into the a small living room. Uh, you have the small kitchenette and then you have the, the bedroom with a small bathroom. You know, reduced to essentials, but very important. Very important for those people using them. And here, that's how they were built being prefabricated and brought to the site, colorful as they are. Now, the place in Ladywell, London, 2014-2016, it's interesting that as he approached the end of his life, he allocated also, you know, time, resources, talent, involvement to uh, modest, uh, modest buildings. Ladywell pop-up village. The place Lady Well is the UK's first pop-up village with temporary homes, a cool cafe, a thriving indoor market, and workspace for entrepreneurs and charities. The resident takes a peek at this cool new community hangout. So I read because it moved me the story. When Lady Well Leisure Center was demolished in 2014, Lewisham Council decided to put the site to good use. Instead of leaving a yawning gap in the high street while new built and estate regeneration programs were being developed for the site, 
the council worked with architects Rogers, Stirk, Harbor, and partners to create place, Ladywell, a Lego bright temporary residential development, offering a short-term solution to the housing crisis in the borough. And here is the, the rendering of this um, complex of uh, housing units. Is this good architecture? Yes, it is. Who said that the poor shouldn't have colors? They should, maybe even more than the rich. This is what architecture can do and should do. Improve life, not just in terms of uh, measurable functionalism, but also in terms of expression, of emotion. Good Hope is the second site for the cafe that runs the ra to raise funds for the charity for Jimmy. The original site in Heather Green is currently undergoing a refit following a flood. You know, a modest um, uh, gathering room. Fine, saying yes to life. Then the indoor market at Place Lady Well includes the Thunder and Lightning Fashion Boutique run by Morgan Weber Newman. Here she is. She always wanted to have a boutique and she never afforded it. Well, she afforded one in this, in, 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 in this complex of buildings and she seems happy. Then a florist run by Anne-Marie Lichmore, who sells both silk and real floral arrangements. And here there are the floral arrangements. I included these small fragments of life as lived because I think they are inspiring. And an Italian deli, We Love Pasta, run by Sicilian Corrado Scala, selling homemade tagliatelle uh, tagliatelle, I don't know if I pronounce well, organic sauces, ice cream, and more. Here it is. And there is also a bring and fix, inviting people to share their skills, fix bikes, and more. Everything is about and more. So there is so much hope in this and more. It's not really about quantity, it's about quality. The quality of bringing people together. And architecture can contribute significantly. And his last work, and with this I end this presentation of Sir Richard Rogers, is the work that we saw in sketches as we began our journey through his work. And here is the built work. A gallery that cantilevers 27 meters out above the hillside at the Chateau Lacoste Vineyard, vineyard in southern France. It, it literally wants to take off like a plane. There are other architects who think that the future of architecture will be anti-gravitational, but in this case is about something else. It's about an architect who was um, probably feeling that the end of his life will come and his, his, his swan song, and it's not a pessimistic swan song, it is an optimistic swan song. It is the swan song of a very good architect who celebrated life through his works, who, you know, uh, uh, was able to defeat depression and feeling stupid as a child, becoming a baron, and now flying. Look at this. You know, this is the work of an older man, but actually a very young man in his soul. This pavilion takes off. It's supported only there, at the very bottom, in the, in the background, and we are going to see details of this. I love this picture. This picture should be shown to every depressed person on this earth, because this picture shows that through perseverance, through talent, through work, through, through, through faith even, you can, you can conquer 
the demons of uh, defeat and the demons of suffering. Am I too exalted in my assessment of Sir Richard Rogers? Yeah, the interior doesn't exalt me. It's true. Art is needed. Those white walls should be, um, you know, the, uh, the backgrounds on which um, vital art is shown or discrete art, but art, something to transcend the, the clean whiteness. And also the flooring is... Uh, you know, conveniently polished and conveniently civilized, and so is the ceiling. But, but the outside of the building, so this is a container for art, a pavilion for art. But the interior, the exterior, and also, you know, the, the way he uh, resolved uh, and expressed the structural forces of this building, which is uh, connected to earth only here and here, and also through these. Uh, tensioned uh, cables. Look at this. It's it's a detail in steel. But it's it's uplifting, not just through color, but also through the way it is designed. And then when you know that the whole building is not a huge building, but still is 27 meters long, my God, my God. It's not so short, is it? I still don't believe it's 27 meters long. It seems to be shorter, but maybe I'm wrong. No, it could be actually. When I look at the small house there on the right side, and it's only connected to the earth on the right side, as we saw. It's, uh, it's. Uh, I wish I had more pictures with this. I should have had. So again, from here to the other side, the building, is taking off. The building says goodbye gravity, goodbye, you know, the convenience and the certitude of gravity. I want to fly. And it does fly. It does fly. Doesn't it? So let's, uh, let's wish happy birthday to Sir Richard Rogers. He's an inspiration. Thank you.